As the head of business management education of the EOI Business School, it is a pleasure for me to welcome you to our school and to this event entitled New Development and Trends in Sustainability Communications by Larry Parnell, and a special guest and also an outstanding speaker. Larry Parnell, as you can see here, is Associate Professor and Director of the Strategic Public Relations Program at the Graduate School of Political Management of George Washington University. Mr. Parnell, we are really grateful to have you with us. Thank, Thank you. you. Also, our special appreciation to our two other guests, to Angela Yoza, Director of Corporate Excellence Center for Reputation Leadership, and to Carlos Barrera, Director of the Master in Political and Corporate Communication at Universidad de Navarra. This event takes place under the framework of collaboration with Corporate Excellence, which is our partner in El Programa Ejecutivo en Análisis y Gestión de Intangibles para la Marca y la Reputación Corporativa, which will be starting next month. For those of you who have an special interest in the topic of uh, reputation, I announce you that next Monday, and um, under the same framework of collaboration, we are holding a roundtable about the uh, reputation economy, as well as an information session of the program that I just mentioned. You can sign up through our webpage if you want to go. And now I'm going to leave you with our guests. Thank you very much for your attendance. Welcome to, to our school, and I hope you enjoy this lecture. Buenas tardes, uh, good evening. I'm going to mix Spanish and English, if you don't mind. Totally fine. Uh, just a few words about who we are and which are our activities at uh, Corporate Excellence Center for Reputation Leadership. It is a think tank created uh, well, 10 years ago and relaunched last year by these companies. They represent uh, the major Spanish corporations and they decided to join together, even they are, if they are direct competitors, because they wanted to advance jointly in the excellent management of the key intangibles. When I mean, or what do I mean by key intangibles? Well, those are the objectives of, uh, of this think tank. The key intangibles are the following. The five areas in which we are working are corporate reputation, the corporate brand, public affairs, metrics in order to demonstrate the, uh, the return on the management of those intangibles, and also training programs. We do this basically to work for people like you, for the professionals who are working in the field of communication because uh, we want to improve, to upgrade the function of the chief communication officer within the, the corporations, both the institutions and the, and the companies. And we would like to do that because, uh, at least in Spain, the role of a corporate communication director is not really well established. And if you have a financial director who leaves the company, the next one is going to come with exactly the same functions than the former one. But if the corporate communication director leaves, the next one, you don't have 100% sure that uh, you will continue having under your functions things like internal communication, advertising, the brand, and you are risking that those functions will come back to human resources, to marketing, etc., etc. And because we are firmly convinced that the future of companies and organizations is basically in the excellent management of those intangibles, that's why we feel that there is a strong need to improve and to upgrade the function of, this, of those chief communication officers. And basically what we do as a non-profit organization is to share with uh, all of you with the rest of the business community, with the academic community, all the research and the publications that we uh, undertake. Everything is on our web page. 
and uh, we w we invite you to join the news the newsletter that we publish every week in both in Spanish and in English and to join our small but growing community of uh, professionals interested in uh, the management of the intangibles finally I would like to thank again the uh, Facultad de Comunicación de Navarra and uh, the Escuela de Organización Industrial, two of the alliances in the academic world with whom we developed joint programs and joint activities. Thank you very much. Good evening. Mm, as a director of the master's degree in political and corporate communication at the University of Navarra, I want to briefly introduce uh, some uh, outline about the about this program. Um, um, the, the main uh, the main point, of course, is introduce uh, Larry Parnell, our. Professor, in uh, during the during the four-week program that uh, all our, our students spend every March in Washington D.C., we uh, we, we have an, an agreement with the um, Graduate School of Political Management in the York Washington University, and Larry Parnell is one of the professors in charge of the classes. Although in this uh, travel he will uh, t uh, he will teach in Pamplona uh, tomorrow and the day after tomorrow as well to the ninth edition of the, uh, our master's degree um, we started in 2004 as an initiative of our school of communication and uh, with the um, cooperation of the graduate school of political management of the George Washington University. Uh, thanks to this agreement, our students uh, have a um, four-week program with um, lectures and activities and different activities in, um, in developing in Washington DC with um, important uh, outstanding professionals in, in, in the field. So it's uh, for us it's uh, many, many of you, some of our alum, alumni are here present in, in, this, in, this, in this room. So they, they can uh, explain better than, even than, than me what uh, a really uh, rich experience is for, for, for them. Um, our goals basically are to contribute to a sound and solid background, uh, training sorry, of the future pra practitioners in, in the field of corporate and political communication. And Washington is um, really a very good or even perfect location for this for these fields uh, to enhance the role the, of communication directors in organizations of uh, of ev any kind in the social political economic uh, or cultural uh, uh, sphere and um, it's um, also our goal to act as a bridge between so po politics economies and society i think that in these times precisely in these times of crisis to recover th this, um, this trust sometimes lost uh, between um, um, both, uh, um, both no, not opposite, but sometimes it happens as opposite sides, politics and society or economics and society, I think that we have um, a very important challenge uh, there. Um, Larry has been introduced uh, by uh, Anna, but uh, I, I, I only want to uh, to remind that he, he has a very long uh, um, professional background in PR issues. Uh, he has, has been working uh, for many, many years. And, uh, but um, precisely for this reason, as uh, now as director of uh, the master's degree in st uh, strategic PR in the George Washington University, right. Uh, he can develop this new side of teaching uh, the new practitioners in PR. So the the title of the of this uh, of this uh, um, presentation, new developments and trends in sustainability communications, is a, is the result of of his uh, concern about 
Uh, this I think very important issues issue um, because uh, business uh, company companies and society uh, have to to go in the in the same direction in some way. So uh, this is my my presentation. Uh, Larry, it's your turn. Uh, thank you for accepting this invitation uh, from the University of Navarra, Escuela de Organización Industrial and Corporate Excellence. Thank you very much. Everybody hear me? Okay, I'm going to move around a little bit, if that's okay with you guys. Sitting up here in these chairs, I might fall asleep, and we don't want that. Uh, I, I am very pleased to be here. Uh, we have had a long and very mutually beneficial relationship with uh, the University of uh, Navarra um, for almost 10 years, I think, now. And uh, we we're hoping to do more things like this in the future. So those of you who are alums in activity, you'll see this kind of thing happening more and more. Uh, and I'm looking forward to working with the center as well. We've had some conversation about probably working together on some, some projects in the States and perhaps here in, in, in Spain. Uh, my background uh, is, in fact, primarily as a practitioner. Uh, I've worked in politics. I've worked for corporations and I've worked for agencies. I have got involved in academia about five years ago when this program was just getting started. I started teaching a class, enjoyed it. Uh, I was telling Carlos earlier, I felt that, you know, as a, someone who hired young professionals, I was frustrated with the training, the unevenness of the training some people came to our company or our agency with, so I felt I'd do something about it, and now I'm spending five years training the next generation of leaders, so it's very satisfying to me. I'm very pleased to be here to talk about this topic. Uh, I did just come in this morning from Washington, D.C., uh, so I'm counting on strong Spanish coffee, uh, your interaction, and my passion for this subject to get me through the next hour and a half. So if you guys will bear with me, I'm sure we'll have some fun and maybe learn something. Let me ask you first a bit about yourself. It's helpful to know who you're talking to. How many of you are alumni of Navarra? Okay. How many of you are working for corporations now in a communications function? All right. How many are working for agencies? Ketchum, Manning, Salvation, Lee. One. Which firm do you work for? Locally, based in Spain? Yes, you? Well, in my case, I'm working for the grassroots field. Uh-huh. In politics and public affairs? Yeah. Uh-huh. Okay. Good. Well, so we have a mixture of, uh, of corporate. Anybody working in a nonprofit setting? Okay. Who's not working and looking for a job? <laughs> There's always a few. All right. So hire this guy. What do you say? Huh? Okay. Well, I'm going to talk to you about an opportunity, I believe, uh, in this area that I think, you know, we all talk about finding the way to get to seat at the table to be able to be talked to management. It's my belief that social responsibility is that place, is that ticket. And we're going to walk through a little bit of not too much history, but just a little bit, and then get into what the challenges and the opportunities are for communications professionals and why I think uh, there's work to be done and opportunity for young people to get into this field and, and really develop very nicely. So with that, let's get started. Okay, so very briefly we're going to define, so it's always good to have an agreement on what it is we're talking about. So we'll define uh, CSR, what it is and what it's not, important. Uh, talk about the opportunities and challenges that are involved in that. Uh, a little bit, uh, you know, I've, I come from another country and I'll come here and tell you about CSR in Spain, which is a little presumptuous, but I want, to, I want to localize it a bit, uh, anyway, to give you a sense of what I understand is going on here. Then talk about how we can succeed, how we can move forward from here in our communications initiative, and then the good part, the Q&A and the discussions. So if you're all in agreement with that as an approach, let's get started. All right, what I think it's important to do is have agreement on what it is you're talking about. Uh, we use this text in our classes on this topic, and I think it's a very good definition of what social responsibility is. And that is a commitment to improve community well-being through discretionary, important, business practices and contributions of corporate resources. Okay? Discretionary being the key word there. It's a voluntary commitment of resources, not required, not something you have to do by regulators or by the government that you are operating with. 
It's something you're doing on your own related to your company or your strategy, your business or customers. That, in my view, is key to it qualifying as a CSR activity. Agreement, disagreement, okay? It's not charity. We're not talking about charity. We're not talking about you have to provide safe work conditions. You have to pay a decent wage. That's not sustainability, unless you're talking about your supply chain. We'll get to that in a few minutes. Okay, there's sort of four general themes that, that uh, I think are running throughout uh, the whole notion of social responsibility. This also comes from the text. Uh, earning your profits efficiently, that's not CSR. That's good business, okay? Companies should engage in strategic philanthropy. We'll break that down later on as to what that is. But it's defined here as good acts to improve quality of life and serve society. Again, not stuff that you have to do, but stuff that you do voluntarily that has a benefit for your company and your markets that you operate in, okay? You should strive to meet or exceed stakeholder expectations. By stakeholders, I'm talking about anybody with a stake in your company or your client's activities. Customers, employees, government, competition, management, etc. okay? And the key really is that strategic philanthropy is what you want to do, not traditional, and we'll talk about that difference. This, by the way, comes from a, a study, some research at the Institute for Public Relations Research, which it, it operates out of the University of Florida. The website is www.ipr, I think, .org. It's referenced in my materials. It's a great site, it's free. There's research material there, trend data there all the time, so I really encourage you to take a look at that site. Uh, you'll find a lot of good stuff there for your work. So let's talk about traditional versus strategic social responsibility. Traditional CSR is fulfilling an obligation. Like I said, paying a decent wage, making safe working conditions, etc. That's table stakes. That's what you have to do. That's not CSR. Uh, some companies will say, we're going we're to give, at the end of the year, 1%, 2%, 3%, 4%, whatever the number is, uh, of pre-tax earnings or revenues to charity. That's charitable donations, not necessarily, in my view, CSR. Traditionally, companies avoided controversial topics, whether it was a supporting AIDS research or other situations that they did not want to handle because their stockholders might get upset, and they kind of left it for the government to handle, and we know how well that worked out. So um, I was chatting with somebody before. I think more and more what you're seeing is companies are leading the way around the world in changes that are happening locally in society because local governments can't seem to get through the political hoops to get it done. So there's an opportunity there. So kind of the operating philosophy was let's, let's do good easily, quietly, no fuss, no muss, and we'll write it up on our annual report every year and we'll call it a day. Strategic CSR, in my view, is the, the notion of doing well by doing good. It's possible to improve your profits, improve your operation, improve your working conditions, and do well as a company, as an organization, in your society, in your local markets where you operate. It's very important that you connect what you're doing with your corporate values, the mission, the expertise, the strategy. It's not a random thing you do over here on the side because it's what you're supposed to do. There's got to be a connection or it doesn't last. It doesn't stick. And employees don't get it and customers don't get it and it doesn't last very long. How many of you have seen companies make big announcements about we're going to support uh, uh, Africa? because they think it's in the vogue. It has nothing to do with their business. The, the example I give to my students is uh, Macy's, which is a large retail department store in the United States. Said for every $100 you spend, we're going to buy a mosquito net to give to people in Africa to reduce malaria. Wonderful cause. It has nothing to do with what Macy's does for a living. It has nothing to do with its customers. Its employees say, well, that's nice. So you do it because you want to go to Macy's anyway. But there's no benefit, there's no sustainability, pun intended, for that kind of activity. That's not strategic, that's just, well, let's do it because everybody else is doing something in Africa, okay? 
Um, other things that are happening, people are working with nonprofits and NGOs, and they're doing distribution jointly for activities. They're volunteering employee time against the goal or objective, whatever it's Habitat for Humanity or, you know, water management in a given part of the world. And integrating the sponsorships that you are involved in corporately. Coca-Cola does this very well. Uh, into your marketing and advertising, okay? What are the benefits of doing this? Why should we bother? Other than if it keeps us something to do with our time and it feels good. Well, recent research by this group called Business for Social Responsibility shows the following, that companies who are involved in the strategic CSR, like I just described, see increased sales and market share, strengthen brand positioning, as he was talking about earlier, enhance corporate image and clout, whatever you want to call that in the marketplace. Importantly, the ability to attract and motivate and keep employees. In a competitive marketplace, when someone's trying to decide between, God willing, a couple of offers, the company with a better reputation for doing well in the community is going to be the one that more and more young people like yourselves want to work for. It's not just about the compensation. Oh, that's important. Uh, you can see decreased operating costs. If you are more efficiently managing your use of water, electricity, resources, your supply chain, guess what? Your costs go down. You get up, your margins are better. And your CEO is happy. And your CFO is happier. So these are things to think about. And we'll talk about this later. There's an increased appeal to investors. If you're familiar with socially responsible investors, there's multi, multi billions, sometimes even trillions of dollars in the, in the marketplace that's looking for companies who are involved in this kind of activity. And these funds that invest in stocks and bonds want to invest in companies that are responsible. If you don't do it, you don't get to play. If you do it, you can attract capital to help you operate your business. Okay. <clears throat> Some recent research from Edelman, you familiar with the firm Edelman? Big firm based in the US, worldwide operations. They have a, uh, a very strong practice in this space and they do a global study, it was the last one that came out uh, in 2000, for 2010 in 2011. This is what the survey of stakeholders told them, customers, employees, investors, etc. They believe and expect CEOs to create innovative products that are socially responsible. Not just innovative, but also socially responsible. They expect CEOs to make a long-term commitment to this activity. They think that CEOs and management should publicly support these issues, be visible on those issues, not just have a staff person do it. And there's an expectation that that management member will motivate the employees to do the same. Volunteer time, give of their own resources, et cetera, et cetera. We talked a bit about the benefits of brand and, and, and business. Cone, another good firm in this space, did a study with Echo Research out of London in 2011, which was a global study. Um, they didn't break it down specifically. I tried to get data for Spain, but they didn't do Spain as one of the individual countries. 94% uh, of the respondents on a global basis to this study, said they would switch to another brand, given a choice, if it was associated with a good cost. Assuming that you know, the values of the two products are about the same, you might buy a Ford versus a Chevy or a Peugeot versus a Fiat or whatever, if they had a better reputation. They're willing to believe companies when they say they're doing this, they believe you're telling the truth because you can figure out pretty quickly if you're not. And they, what the growing uh, demand in the marketplace for this kind of activity from corporations is economic development, not giving money to, for hospitals or, or the, the symphony, which is important, obviously, but economic development. There's a business angle to that, okay? <clears throat> and this is across the, uh, the regions, US, Europe, Russia, China, and Latin America. So this is global. Cohn also did a study some time ago that showed 38% of employees are, are, are more likely to be noticeably proud expressing that uh, in various ways, online, social media, to their friends, 
if they work for a responsible company. BSR Group did a study of MBA students a couple of years back that said more than half would accept a lower, believe it or not, salary from a responsible company versus a not responsible company. How many would work for BP here? Okay, five years ago, you would all raise your hand because it was, they, they screwed up, obviously, but they had that reputation, okay? And you wouldn't want to work for Exxon because their historical reputation was bad. These are things that, that factor into people making decisions. As I mentioned, uh, the, another group looked at MBA students and they had the same kind of issues and same kind of beliefs. <clears throat> we talked about corporate image and regulatory clout, your ability to go before government agencies and get what you want. In many cases, if you're in the natural resource business, which is where I first got involved in social responsibility issues in a mining company, um, you need permission to operate, right? You need to get permits to locate a factory, to build a plant, to manage water, to take gold ore out of a country and make money on it somewhere else. Permission to operate is much easier to get if you have a reputation as a responsible company. Let me give you a very specific example from my experience. We had, we operated, this company I worked for, we operated a, a major mine in uh, Peru, southern Peru. Uh, and we had gone in, as you have to do in the mining industry, because the mines were remote, and we built housing, schools, hospitals, provided care and education for miners and their children, and had been very involved in the community for a number of years. When we were exploring uh, another property in northern Peru, uh, and other companies were competing with us for this same permit, what we did, uh, risky, I recommended it and management believed and I was shocked, but uh, we took a plane and flew the community leaders and the media and the financial representatives of that community from one part of Peru to the other and said, you have the morning to walk around the town, talk to anybody you want to talk to about our, how we do business, and then we're going to have a lunch and we'll talk to you about our plans for the, uh, for the area. All the interactions they had during that morning were generally very positive because we had been a very responsible company in running that mine in southern Peru. Guess who got the license to operate the mine in northern Peru? The other companies didn't. They said, we're going to provide jobs and pay taxes. What else do you want? So, I mean, there's a definite business case for this. That's what I'm trying to say. I mentioned socially responsible investors. 30 trillion US dollars. That's a lot of money. Is in funds that are looking for companies who are responsible operators of their business. They're buying shares, they're long-term holders, they vote with management, they support you. They're good investors to have in your mix. However, if you're not viewed as a responsible company, or if you're in so-called sin areas like tobacco or gambling or whatever, then they're not going to buy your shares. But they've got to find somebody to buy. So why not put yourself forward, do this kind of work, promote yourself in that regard legitimately, and attract those investors? 30 billion, 30 trillion, excuse me. 30 trillion dollars. That'll get a CEO's attention. Very briefly, uh, this is uh, the guy from another country coming and telling you about what's going on in your country, but I wanted to look at this just to get a sense. And this is from a paper done by someone at ESA, uh, your colleague. Um, there is a growing movement, this is historical, in favor of CSR in Spain. Spanish companies reportedly consider corporate reputation, competitive advantage, and industry trends to be the driving forces of CSR. A lot of companies are set telling, reporting to this uh, study, that um, their core business will benefit from this. And the NGOs and the mass media, the public, so to speak, are fostering this development, in fact, bringing pressure to see more of it happen. PricewaterhouseCoopers, um, former competitor of mine, I used to work for Ernst & Young for four years, so I'm citing their research, not ours. Uh, the top four drivers of CSR activity by Spanish companies, according to PricewaterhouseCoopers, are improving reputation, competitive advantage, industry trends, and consumer pressure. These are why companies are getting involved. There's an article that I found uh, on a recent post that was uh, from uh, quoting a guy named Juan Villemayur. Mayur, Touch of Green is his blog. Um, he talks about the regional aspects of CSR in Spain. 
Uh, but also, not uncommonly, um, that there is a sense that many companies get involved in this because of crisis or issues management kind of challenges. They want to, it's a risk management strategy. You're trying to prevent a problem at a plant or a facility or a recall. So that gets people in. That's not uncommon. What you do once you're in is what the key question is. Okay, now there's some challenges. Let's be honest. You live it, I've read about it. We've got a recession in the States. You've got a severe recession here. This is a difficult time to be talking about spending money doing good, right? Nobody wants to hear that. Budget cuts, staff reductions, any communications initiative you want to do is challenged, right? The last thing you want to do, you think, is walk in and say, I got this big idea. They're going to say, Go down the hall and thank you. You're lucky star, you'll have a job. I understand that. Okay, part of the problem is that management doesn't get the connection yet, generally speaking, not just in Spain, between effective CSR and the business benefits from that. And there isn't a clear sense of that in the marketplace in general. That's true in the US, less so. Western Europe, the UK, France, uh, Northern Europe particularly are very good at this, but we are all kind of behind on this. But that's an opportunity for us, right? So there's work to do, right? There's work to do. As I mentioned, PricewaterhouseCoopers said that, that, that FTSE, which is the UK listed companies, versus IBESA, uh, which are IBEX, excuse me, are the Spanish listed companies, much more credibility, much more activity, much more reporting is happening in the UK than is happening here in Spain. Uh, and that's true elsewhere as well. Um, many companies are involved in this, but they're not connecting it with their business strategy. It's something they're doing because they think you're supposed to do this because everybody else is doing it. It's a missed opportunity. So their, their recommendation is, and I would agree with them, and now is the time to lead an innovative change in company's current model of presenting financial and non-financial information like sustainability activities and, act and programs so that the marketplace understands what you're doing, potential employees know what you're doing, the media knows what you're doing, and you get the reputational benefits of this, uh, even in a difficult time. Now, as I said, it's a difficult time to go in and talk about new initiatives when they're talking about cutting back. But if you can demonstrate the link between sustainability, excuse me, activities and business benefits, improved operating profits, employer retention in a difficult economy, reputational benefits in terms of your brand, and I'm sure there's research that the Corporation uh, Excellence, Excellence Group is working on that will show you the link between a, a positive reputation and a good uh, visibility in the marketplace in terms of sales. There's an opportunity here to do something, all right? So, this is where the meat of the presentation is. The rest is just warm up, okay? What are we going to do? How are we going to move forward? What are the keys to being successful? Let's talk about CSR as a business imperative, not, in other words, my recommendation to you is simple. Social responsibility is not a communication strategy. Social responsibility is a business strategy with a communications component. You understand the difference? You do it because it's good business, and then you communicate it and get the benefit for your reputation. But the first reason to do it is it's good business. That's going to get CEOs and CFOs' attention much more than, we're going to get great press if we do this, boss. That's not what they want to hear right now. Okay? Talk a bit about sustainability reporting and partnerships and some key takeaways. You with me so far? Okay, good? All right. Some of the major challenges to effective social responsibility, in my view, are as follows. Choosing the right issue. I mentioned the mosquito nets in Africa for Saks Fifth Avenue or Macy's. Doesn't make any sense. Selecting a specific cause inside of an issue. Let's say you decide you want to work on childhood obesity. Big challenge, big category. You can't do all of that you're going to fail. So you pick a piece of that. Nutrition labeling, nutrition uh, education, uh, exercise programs for your employees and their, and their families. A, a piece of it that you can do, implement, measure, and show progress on, then saying we're going to solve this big problem. 
You're not going to do it. You're going to fail. And then they're going to say, I told you so. Like any other communications activity, you haven't got a good plan, you haven't got a good activity. So you have to really have a thoughtful plan that includes communications, marketing, research, all the components that you'll be studying. Measurement and evaluation, very, very critical. How are you going to know if you're making progress? How are you going to know if you're going in the right direction? And how are you going to show management that you're going to get a return on the investment that they have made? Okay? And the other thing that drives me crazy, and that's sustaining it beyond the launcher. How many, if you go back and look at anybody's sustainability program, big fanfare when they announced they're going to, they're going to cut out malaria in Africa. Okay? A year later, they're not talking about it anymore. A 10-year program to reduce such and such in Africa, and they don't do it for more than a year and a half. Guess what? The credibility, right down the toilet. So don't do that. Don't talk about 10-year programs to solve the world's problems. Talk about measurable, quantifiable things you can show progress on. The keys to success, again, these are my views, but they come from a lot of experience working with companies and doing research on this. It's very important that whatever communications initiatives you undertake, that they are tied to the business of the company, not random things because it's in vogue. Okay? They must be participatory. Customers and employees and people have to be, what do I do? How do I get involved? What, there's got to be some action for people. They must be sustainable, pun intended. Okay? Not a short-term one-off, we're going to give money to solve you know, everybody talks that there's a flood or there's a dilemma or there's a tsunami. We all say we're going to give a bunch of money, and then we stop. That's charity. That's not, it's wonderful. Don't misunderstand me. That's not CSR. That's not solving the infrastructure problem that caused the flooding in the first place. That would be, if you're in the business of building bridges and roads and tunnels, that would be a great business strategy related CSR activity. Giving a check, anybody can do that. There should also be, let's face it, we're PR people. There should be some PR potential for this. It should be something you can promote. Whether it's, you know, progress reports on how many people have signed up, or how many people signed a petition, or how many people have lost weight on your childhood obesity program. You got an NGO involved. They report progress. Everybody gets benefits out of this. There should be a crossover application inside your organization. Human resources should have something they can do with it if they're in terms of charge of internal communications. Advertising should be able to leverage what you're doing. Business partnerships, the industry gets involved in alcohol education or whatever the challenge might be. Update your shareholders, update your stake. Anybody who's got a stake in this, you need to think about how you're going to spread this message across all the groups, not just the newspapers and the media. To make this work, you got to integrate it into your organization, right? It's got to be embedded in the fabric of the organization, not something you do on the side. There needs to be top-down and bottom-up activities and programs, and people can get engaged in this. We all know what cascading communications is, right? Where there's a meeting and a meeting and a meeting and training the trainers, that sort of stuff. That's very important as well. If you're a global company, a national company with multiple operations around your organization, around the world, Doing it in one part and not telling the rest of the company is a missed opportunity. Then as you get insight and progress from what you're doing, make it available. You know, don't be shy. Put it on your website. Put it in your annual report. Put it, in your, uh, put it on social media. Tweet about it. You know, feature pictures. Do YouTube videos. Whatever. Don't, you know. There's nothing wrong with that as long as it's legitimate. It relates to your business. You have measurement. It shows progress, why not promote it? That's our job, right? That's what we do. So here's five tips if your company or your client is doing reporting. By this I'm talking about an annual report where you publish a sustainability report or you put it on the website. First thing is to put it online. Don't just do a big printed book and leave it on a shelf somewhere. Uh, you may use your printed collateral to summarize that. You know, if you put a section in your annual report or you put uh, uh, update at your annual meeting, but ongoing basis. Um, stories and illustrations of how this is working in a given part of the world where you operate is very useful. You know, saying we gave X amount of money to, to improve infrastructure in uh, Thailand is one thing. 
someone whose business is growing and a community that's rebuilding itself because of the bridges and roads you've built because that's what you do, you're a transportation company, is a much more interesting narrative and will get you visibility, will get you PR, and will get you reputational benefits. You should put key performance indicators in some kind of data dashboard on your website, you know, available on a quarterly or other basis that tells how you're doing. Number of people who signed up, number of roads that you fixed, number of pounds lost by kids in a given marketplace that you're working in. And keep it fresh, you know, don't let it get stale online, okay? The other thing I was talking about earlier is the increase in partnerships. What I'm talking about here is, I'll give you an example. For many, many years, a group called the National Resource Defense Fund, I lose track, there's so many NGOs, who've been year after year after year going to Walmart's annual meeting and protesting and causing a stink and trying to get visibility for their concerns over what Walmart was or was not doing, whatever they were concerned about. Minimal impact, a couple of days of coverage, that's it. They got smart. Walmart got smart. They said, if we work together, we can make a lot more progress and fix a lot more problems than sit here and throw rocks at each other at the annual meeting once a year. So working with the National Resource Defense Fund and other NGOs around the world, Walmart has gone back all the way through its supply chain now. And because they're so big and they're so powerful in the marketplace, if you want to sell a product through them, you have to meet all kinds of workplace standards and uh, uh, sustainability standards in manufacturing and reporting. Otherwise, they won't buy your product. Guess what? People are complying because Walmart's the big dog. You've got to do what they say. They're using their leverage, and they're working with this NGO who goes out and does inspections and makes sure that people are, in fact, not employing children, paying them minimal wages, whatever it is that they're concerned about. So partnerships are very important. It also gives you credibility. You know, they may not believe that Walmart cares about, the, you know, working conditions in Thailand, but if an organization working with them says they're involved and they're driving change, you get the benefit. Now let somebody else say something nice about you, legitimately, right? But you have to also be willing to take criticism in that. You know, they're not going to come in and just be a shell for you. So they're going to force some changes on you. You may have to do things you don't really want to do, and that's hard for some management to deal with. On the other hand, if you try and do it yourself, you're not going to get the credibility. So the recommendation is build a partnership with an NGO that has credibility, that will work with you on reasonable outcomes. Apple had the same issue when they had the problem with the uh, plant in China. Uh, they went to an organization uh, where one of my students actually works called Fair Labor Organization and had them do an inspection of the plant where they build all the iPods and the iPads and everything. You all saw the coverage where the nets around all the buildings to prevent the suicides that were going on. Big problem for Apple, especially because Apple is such a cool brand. Their initial response was, that's a manufacturing company. We don't own it. We don't control it. So we can't do anything about it. We're awful sorry. That didn't work. So they hired this group. They went in. They did an inspection. They made recommendations. And in order to keep the Apple contract there, slowly, but gradually making the improvements in working conditions, hours, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, uh, in this plant in remote China because they have an NGO working with them. Okay, we're almost through, guys. Uh, key takeaways. Reporting of CSR activity by the media, by the public, and by companies is here to stay. It's not going to go away. You can't just say, man, we'll just, you know, if we, if we put our head down for a while, we're not going to have to deal with this because it's going to only get more and more, especially in a difficult economy with challenges and problems and governments around the world looking for business to solve problems that they can't solve for whatever reason, political will, capital, whatever. So get used to it. More transparency with what you're doing in the community, reporting, updating people, problems that you experience and solutions that you come up with uh, is much better than waiting till you have a crisis and then saying, but we're good guys. You know, look at what we've been doing. At that point, people have already got a problem with what you're doing. So you're better off 
engaging in the kind of activity and programs that create positive reputation, when inevitably something goes wrong, you get a little more slack than somebody who hasn't said anything about what they're doing. It's risk management, think of it that way. Good way to get CEOs and CFOs excited, or not so critical. It can be measured, it should be measured, and if you want to succeed, it has to be measured in very tangible ways. Specific numbers of signings and donations, whatever you come up with that you're doing, make sure you have measurable milestones you can report on, and then you can demonstrate progress. Good for budget improvement, good for public consumption, good for the program. I think I've made my case, maybe I haven't, but I think I have. This is a big opportunity for PR people. We all talk about the big seat at the table, getting management's attention, et cetera, et cetera. Bottom line profitability, brand building, reputation improvement, employees who want to work for your company versus somebody else, governments who give you permission to operate. Those are all good things. And who's the logical person inside the typical corporation to be involved in what is essentially a stakeholder management activity. It's not the HR department. It's not the engineering department. Not the legal department. It's communications. We're going to get stuck with it anyway when it becomes a problem. So why not own it up front and take advantage of it and get that seat at the table we all talk about. From a business perspective, perspective let me just reiterate to you, to succeed, CSR initiatives must be business related, have appeal or at least address the concerns of all your stakeholders. Remember, a stakeholder is somebody pro or con, not just your friends. And be measurable so you can show progress. Okay, that's my remarks. I don't know how you want to handle the questions and just shout them out, whatever you guys want to do. Uh, uh, thank you, Larry, for this for such a, a suggestive uh, presentation, I think. Uh, many ideas have been spread in, in this room around this presentation, and now it's your, your turn, the, the turn of the audience to make uh, questions, uh, comments, remarks about about uh, right. this presentation, and Larry is ready to, to answer. Please. Who's got a question? Please, the first. Yeah. Yes, sir. I saw your hand first. Okay. Thank you, Larry, for uh, your presentation. My pleasure. <coughs> uh, you have talked about uh, the integrated report. Uh, I'm working for a listed company. Yeah. And uh, we are thinking about uh, to include. To, to improve our, uh, our reporting. Yes. And uh, my question is, from your point of view, what is a good, a very good integrated report? Well, I think it doesn't need to be a phone book. You're a phone book, because remember those things that they think she pulls up? But, I don't know. Sure. It's, it's a micro, mi microphone. Oh, I, need to, I took that off. Microphone, sorry, or, of course they have it. I'll take or, this or maybe thing. this one. Yeah. This one? Sorry for that. Okay, for, I, I don't think it needs to be big and thick and heavy. I think it needs to be specific. I think it needs to show a, a objective or objectives that you're trying to accomplish. Progress, I talk about the measurement situation, progress against those objectives. And stories that illustrate and make people engaged. I'm happy to chat with you about it uh, separately, but I think in general those are good solutions to any kind of communications piece you're doing, but specifically one that is fraught with so many expectations. Does that answer your question? Okay. Yeah. yeah. Well, uh, thank you, Larry. This was really interesting for me, especially because I, uh, well, I'm from El Salvador, so I work for uh, NGO. Uh, we do, we basically search companies to uh, to hire disabled people mm -hmm. so in my country I, I think basically this is a general problem for for every disabled person 
But in my country, we have like these beautiful laws that make uh, companies to hire uh, one person for every 25 employees that a company has. But I'm trying to put up a presentation so that I can make the, the maybe HR, uh, HR manager or, or even the, the president of the company or the main board of the company. Mm -hmm. And I'm trying to put up a presentation so that I can make them hire people with disabilities. And I'm actually, I'm trying to look for the companies that have their, I mean, the, those causes apply to, I mean, every company can hire a person with disability, but I'm trying to look at for maybe CSR programs that can be matched with my cause. So the thing is that I, I just want to, maybe you can advise me on three things that my presentation, basically a PowerPoint presentation that I'm trying to, to put up together, uh, that m these people will, will, will <laughs> I mean, we'll, we'll get my point. So that, that I will convince them to maybe sponsor my programs or, or even hire disabled people. So let me understand you, what you're asking. There is a law that requires this to happen. Yes. But it's not happening. It's not happening. Shocking, isn't it? <laughs> uh, well, I would suggest to you a couple things. I don't know the specifics of your organization or, or, the, uh, or what's going on in your country, but I would think that in any case where you can, um, my experience in working with companies often will be, they'll say, who else is doing this? They want examples of other people doing what it is you're asking them to do. So anecdotal stories and examples of who is doing it well and getting credit for it might get somebody's attention. Uh, are there other competing NGOs that are trying to do the same thing you're doing? It's supposed that the government must do this. There's a program of the... I know, the but is there other NGOs that want to get people to hire disabled stu uh, not citizens? Not really. Not really. Not, not so as you know, a it's not a question of them going to somebody else versus you. They're just not doing it. Yeah. Um, then you have to show them the economic benefits of it. Uh, you'd have to demonstrate to them um, that this is... What is the risk if they don't do it? You know, it's not complying with the law. Now, if the government's not enforcing the law, then there's not, not much of a risk. So it's hard to say without knowing the details. But I would say to you, if you have a situation where there are some people that are doing it and doing it well, who are your partners, promoting what they're doing and how it's benefiting their company is going to get a lot of people over the hump of deciding that they should do it as well. And personalizing it to the extent that you can with good stories about how it's helping families, helping communities. and people are getting benefits from it might, might get you there. But it's the kind of thing that probably takes a more detailed discussion. But off the top of my head, those would be the things I would recommend. Okay. Yeah, another question there. Hi. Hello. Uh, well, I just wanted to know uh, your point of view regarding the role of the assurance and uh, Accountability systems uh, for the for the com um, sustainability communications. Mm -hmm. The uh, the the role of, of to my measurement now. Are you talking about who's going to be in charge? I'm not trying to understand what you're asking me. Yes, mm, because now in, in Spain there is some well some discussion about if uh, if um, those um, assurance reports should be mandatory or not or if the information without those stamps is uh, uh, good or not. Oh, are you talking about the organizations that give you ratings and things like that, like serious No, not reports? the ratings, just the, the assurance uh, regarding if you, if you have uh, done a good job, right. then you deserve an right. uh, okay. GRI A right. plus or whatever. Right. I think a number of things. One, I think that there are, there are organizations that will independently assess your performance against those goals. Uh, and that is important for credibility purposes. Um, there are the major accounting firms are talking about having a practice that does this. PwC has a section of their website. Most of the consultants will do it. Uh, it's a business opportunity for them. That's why they're doing it. But I think that um, to the extent that you can demonstrate that you are making progress. Sorry, uh, I think that your microphone is not all. Put, put it in. Ah. Yeah, yes. 
to the extent that you can yeah. show you're making progress, it starts with, with the organization. If you lay out, these are our three goals this year. Very specific goals, whatever they happen to be. There's a couple of benefits that, let's say you decide this year we're gonna work on adult literacy. The benefit of that is, somebody can come to you and say, I, I wanna talk to you about childhood obesity. You say, yeah, that's a really wonderful cause, but that this year I'm doing adult literacy. Number one, you get off the hook for everybody else asking you to do stuff. Number two, the more specific you are about what you're going to do, the ability to show progress against objectives that you've set up for yourself are going to be accomplished. And then the third thing is these are organizations that will come in and do an audit. I think that's very important to show independently you are in fact complying with what you said you're going to do. Saying you're doing it yourself without anybody giving you the outside perspective, this goes back to the partnership idea I talked about. If, if, you're in a, if your activity is something in a space like hiring the disabled, then you work with someone whose job it is to help you do that and they report, yes, they are complying and doing great things. It's much better to have her say that about you than you say it about yourself. Agree? Does that answer your question? Okay. Oh, in the front. Yeah. I recognize you. I'm going to sit down. Actually, this is not my question. <laughs> it's from one of our followers by Twitter. Oh, and yeah. he is uh, Tomas Conde from BBVA. He's responsible of the uh, uh, sustainability in uh -huh. the bank. And he asked about um, why financial institutions reports are so scared on integrating environments, social, and government, like the, the, the three the three things, the, the non-financial Why are they scarce on that, did you say? Yeah, they say, they say like in BBVA, they have the too many to improve. They have to improve that, uh -huh. but they are doing. But he wants to know your opinion about it. Well, I don't know the specifics of what BBVA does. I, I have actually done in the past some work for that other bank in town, Santander. Uh, but I will tell you that one of the challenges of a lot of CSR began it, uh, because of regulated industries like banks and mining companies and utilities and phone companies because you have to report to regulators anyway. Uh, and there is an expectation and a format around that that probably is part of the problem. Uh, but it may be a question of how well the company is presenting what their goals and objectives are. I'm not really sure the details of what BBVA is doing. Uh, but banks for many years in the States, and I'm sure it's true here as well in Spain, because you have a franchise to take in deposits from the public, and not everybody is on the street doing that, you have you know, an expectation you're going to reinvest in the community that you're operating in. So that's probably the first hurdle that most banks get, get asked on. You perhaps may not more know about BBVA's operations than I do, uh, but uh, th that would be my expectation. It may be a, a question of what it is that they're expected to be doing versus what they're doing and how well they're presenting it to the, to the public. Okay? Any more questions? Yeah, David. Well, for, uh, first of all, thanks for the opportunity of the talk. Uh, I would say, actually, it's not, a, it's not a specific question, it's a comment. Uh, I do believe in CSR as an opportunity for big companies. Mm -hmm. But sometimes when I'm hearing this sort of talks, I got the impression that it's like a one direction conversa conversation, you know, like c CSR is not a, a feedback or, or uh, uh, you mentioned some stakeholders of the company, but most of them were internal stakeholders, like right. the shareholders right. and the investors mm -hmm. and the employees. What about the external uh, stakeholders, the users, the consumers, or the potential oh, consumers. Right. If I didn't make that clear, that's very important. You know, because consumers, as I mentioned, given the opportunity to make a purchase decision hmm. between two companies that have, you know, the similar product, are likely to buy one versus the other on the basis of the company's reputation. So from an external perspective, consumers are very important if you happen to be a consumer-facing company. If you're a business-to-business -business company, it's a little different. Uh, and then your constituency there may be your, your customers who are other banks or other insurance companies or, or the market, whoever. 
But I think it's equally important that it should be a two-way conversation inside and outside the organization. If that wasn't clear, I'm glad you brought it up. It's very critical. Yeah, but the point is maybe I didn't express it. You know, like when you are dealing with a CSR plan, you mentioned that it must be a mid or long-term plan. Mm -hmm. uh, setting up the objectives or uh, the goals, I heard, like, must be so close to the business core of the company or whatever. Right. What about the feedback uh, with the external? Maybe, I don't know if sh this should be, in your view, some uh, ongoing uh, exam, ongoing review mm -hmm. through, I don't know, social media, some other tools, or right. this feedback should be even the beginning, in the, at the beginning of the CSR designing mm -hmm. plan? Well, I, I think there's been some very good examples recently of companies who've basically outsourced, um, in, in a way, uh, their CSR activity in the sense that like the Pepsi refresh project, are you familiar with that? Is that was that done in, what Pepsi did was they set aside, I forgot the number, it was maybe the US market, let's say for the sake of discussion, $10 million dollars they were going to invest in the community. They had people go on social media, on various websites and tell Pepsi who they thought they should invest that money in and why. So there's a dialogue with the community that Pepsi was serving about where the money should be spent. American Express did something called the Membership Project, uh, which is similar to that, where there was, a, there was like a, they picked a half a dozen charities that they felt strongly about that were related to their business, and they said to their customers, who should we invest in, who should we partner with, who should we work with to solve these problems facing our, our economy and our country and our world. So the, the interaction with the outside uh, be, made it a much stronger program than them simply deciding we're going to work with, you know, one charity or the other. So I think, especially in the formative stages of what you decide to do, getting outside input as to what direction you should go in is really a strong point in favor of something that lasts. Thanks. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you. I think that the, uh, the time is over for, uh, for the um, discussion, for the public discussion. Uh, nevertheless, we have now some some time to uh, to share and to t to talk to each other during the is in the cafe in the cafeteria. No? There's some refreshments in the in the cafeteria. Um, so, so, sorry. Well, um, one announcement at, at the end. Make, make the announcement, please. Bueno, comunicar este que dentro de la información que les hemos dado a la entrada están las encuestas de, de satisfacción para que valoren la actividad, para que sigamos bueno trabajando y esforzándonos para mostrar más más conferencias como estas de interés. Muchas gracias. Okay. I only want to uh, th th thank Larry again for this uh, for the, the presentation and especially for the, because um, he just. Uh, uh, arrived from Washington in this uh, early morning, so <laughs> the jet lag. I think that is <laughs> is one of the main problems <laughs> at this time of the of the evening. And, um, and but uh, uh, he will be in, in the in the cafeteria uh, sharing with us uh, th this uh, this last uh, minutes of the of the session. So thank you all for uh, attending this uh, this uh, this event, and thank you especially to Rari for for this.